Hola. All right. So more than ever before, marketing leaders must be connected. They must be connected to their consumers, fans, content, partners, and then even technologies. So we've been hosting the CMO Connect series at several events this year, bringing on CMOs from the Daily Mail, Refinery29, Belkin, and several others. But today I'm excited because we have three mobile first CMOs here to share insights on how they tune their marketing strategy to stay ahead in our mobile economy. So everyone here has actually had apps hit the top charts, so they probably don't need an introduction. But before we kick off the conversation, I will have them talk a little bit about who they are and maybe give a quick shout out about the app that they market. So Ian, we can get started with you. Sure, so Ian Flyflit, uh, VP of Marketing at OfferUp, prior to OfferUp, which I joined about three years ago. I was at Real Networks for a long time working on Rhapsody, social games. Uh, but been at OfferUp the last three years, and OfferUp, for those of you who don't know, it's a mobile marketplace for local buying and selling. Uh, we're generally one of the top two shopping apps on both app stores, and this year we're going to have about $14 billion of, of transactions. Crushing it. <laughs> What's going on, guys? My name is Adam Jaffe. I'm the CMO of a company called ABA English. We're an education technology company based out of Barcelona. But prior to that, I have uh, set up marketing company. Uh, sorry, set up marketing departments in some of the largest gaming companies in the world. So, got my start with a company called Playtica, who was the first person doing marketing for them for almost an entire year, uh, launching Slotomania both on uh, iOS and Android. Then moving over to SGN. Uh, whose rapid growth in the last couple of years has just been phenomenal. And then, as most recently before ABA English, was with a company called Social Point. And some of you might know the application Dragon City. So I uh, established the marketing department for that company as well. And my name is Ville Heijeri. Uh, I work at Rovio. Actually, my second stint at Rovio now. So uh, I was working at Rovio when Angry Birds was growing up and, uh, and building the marketing team over there. I, I think that's probably my, my biggest accomplishment in, in, in that time. And then I went to work in, in the much sexier industry for a couple of years, which is mobile ad tech. Uh, and now, now back at Rovio, where, where my biggest accomplishment thus far is, is getting this hat produced, which, um, which is either the, the best thing ever or, or the worst joke in the world, depending on your, where you kind of <laughs> lean. But uh, yeah, excited to be let's on this show panel. Off the hat yeah, a let's bit. take a, have, have, have take a look at it. wave it around. Jesus. Yeah, make marketing. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the hat off now. So. <laughs> okay. It's for sale. If you guys want it later, yeah, you can come it's, talk to it's, us. It's, it's, it's unique. All right. So I know we're going to talk about three big topics today. The first one being growth. So as a CMO, what are, your, what are some of the dynamics that you see come into play when you start to think about the launch strategy for all of your big app launches? I mean, for OfferUp, it's, it's a little different than, uh, than games. Uh, we're a marketplace, so for a marketplace, you need to create supply and demand. And for us, the, the, the question people always ask is, you know, was it the chicken or the egg? Was it the supply side or the demand side? And, and really what we focused on was both at the same time, to be able to figure out how to create a compelling experience for our, uh, our users who are both buyers and sellers. Uh, once you can create that compelling experience, and I know it's similar in games, early on, then you're going to have a much better chance of retaining people and creating that, that flywheel, if, if you will. So in the, in the early days when I was working at, um, at Playtica, so we had growth was basically through the platform. So we were focused on, on Facebook and we were going through the viral channels that they provided. And obviously when we launched on iOS, just being at the top charts was, was enough to, to generate huge numbers of downloads. And today, basically, the biggest challenge is finding that growth vehicle, but it can't come from the platforms anymore. So working in education and, and thinking about the product is how do we produce a product that actually wants to be produced, sorry, that people want to tell their friends about. So it's, as a marketer today, I, I don't think in the same way as I thought five years ago. I think about, I'm, I'm sending this out to a, to a person, now I need to create this really omni-channel approach, which I brought them in in a download, but that's not enough. So I, in my team, I manage also the, the monetization side, which is more like a promotional aspect of the, of the application's sort of life cycle. So it's, we do a lot of emailing, we do a lot of what we call lead cultivation, and we try and build up a, a brand awareness, a brand sort of equity with, the, with our, our students in order for them to say, hey, you know, Juan, this is a great application for learning English, why don't you take it? And I think that's sort of the next challenge for, for marketers and companies today is 
it's a big ocean out there and it's really, really red. So how do I differentiate myself from, from everyone else and, and make something that actually people want to talk about? Uh, exactly. I, uh, Rovio comes from a background of also having like a premium app uh, dominating exactly that kind of marketplace where like just sitting on the top of the charts is, is enough to generate like more, more, uh, more downloads and more installs and more revenue. And of course, like we've had a bit of a ba painful transition over the years of moving from, from, the, from the premium paradigm to, to freemium economy, which, which I'm really happy to say we're like run, running, on, running on all cylinders on. Uh, I would say that like our biggest advantage, how we're looking at like launching new products, is still our existing games portfolio. So we have a lot of internal data, which we of course then need to enrich with uh, with uh, with a lot of like sort of third party and market data on sort of finding new audiences, valuable audiences who are out in the wild. Uh, we obviously we have this shadow of the bird where, where we, we built like a game so big that, that from, a, from a purely like reach and download perspective, like it's a ridiculous benchmark to launch games against today. Uh, but then uh, that said, like well, we're really confident that we can, we can uh, launch games that maybe have like a much smaller audience but can be vastly more profitable. So you each have mentioned a little bit about the thought strategy for pre-launch. And Adam, you mentioned something about how do you differentiate when it's so competitive these days? How have you thought about really making your app experience or building your brand so that it's unique compared to other similar types of companies? I mean, it's challenging in the, in the uh, era of anybody being able to copy exactly what you're doing because there's exposure to what's successful. You, Someone sees you going up the App Store charts, and then tomorrow, the next day, you have you have a copycat out there. So, um, you know, Adam touched on this before, and it's interesting because your transition from social games to a, a not to, to kind of a regular utility is what for growth in a non-social kind of game. Maybe with the exception of Rovio, is you really need strong word of mouth, and it word of mouth comes from um, consumers getting over that hump of what 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 they need to, to have, the experience that they need to be able to tell their friends about something. And, and, and what we've discovered at OfferUp is that, first of all, you have to provide practical value. And then it needs to be of such value that the, the consumer is going to feel good about telling their, their friends about it so they have confidence in the product. So, you know, Angry Birds, people felt so good and this, the, there was these strong emotions with playing it. And it got to the point where people would say, hey, you got to play Angry Birds. But for a game to get to that level, it's, it's, it's so rare. And, and, and Adam, you're in that transition of moving to that now. It is exactly right. And I think, you know, when I'm thinking about my, my product and the way that I, I market it, I tend now to think a lot more about my users than I did in the past. I, I tend to think, if I'm putting this in front of them, what's their reaction? I, I remember reading um, some statistics back, uh, it was maybe like a year and a half ago, and they were talking about where do downloads come from? You know, so the big conception was, or, or I guess it was the, a misconception, that the App Store was the place that people actually took the, took the app. But that's where the exposure was happening. And this report basically said, no, that's not correct. More than 50% of your app downloads are going to come from somebody telling their friend about this app and then them bypassing all of your marketing and you know sophisticated monetization techniques and just going and downloading it themselves. So my, my vision after looking at that was thinking, okay, so how can I create that? How can I create that event in that person's mind in order to, to give, him, give it over to him to tell his friend? And so my marketing strategy has shifted subtly more towards the idea of creating this trigger event in the, in the moment of the user that matches with my product. So English language learning for most of you here has no bearing in your life, but for a billion or more people in the world, having a high level of English can mean 20, 30, 40% more salary, it can mean job opportunities around the world. And so we try and basically match our marketing to the needs of the, of the user. And it's not saying to them, hey, download a, an English language app for free, it's, you know, change your life. You know, wouldn't you like to be in a position of financial security and, and things like that, and we try and, and match that with, with our product. So. Yeah, I think that's, that's like a sort of recurring topic that, that like the sharing and word of mouth just comes on top in, in all of the research that, 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 that's done on like where do, where do people actually discover apps. Uh, that said, like, like it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting shift for game developers as well where like uh, if like you're making, let's say you make a game which, which is really leaning on multiplayer, social, competitive gameplay, uh, like the key sort of function of the game becomes that like social element. Like you're launching the game, it doesn't make any sense. Like, of course, you're gonna have like some kind of technical launch and test like whether the server architecture and the and the and the 3D shaders and whatnot are working. But it all becomes irrelevant unless the, the sharing components and the, the sort of uh, multiplayer components aren't there already in place. 
I would even say that yeah, you can't yeah. predict it. I mean, that's one of the things yeah. that, I mean, there was a game that was launched recently in Pokemon Go that, that no one in their, in their right mind would ever have assumed would, would be as successful. Even Angry Birds couldn't have predicted the, the success of the application. And I think planning for it would be, uh, would be wise, but banking on it would be a mistake. So you have to understand the user, you have to understand the mentality of why somebody would want to go out there and, and proliferate the message of your own application. And I think in this way, the marketer just needs to be a bit smarter, a bit, a bit more of a storyteller than maybe it, it was in the past where you could simply just put a Facebook ad up and, and let the, the platform do the work for you. So next, why don't we talk about after you see this hyper growth and you're at the top, at your peak, as a marketer, how do you think about really developing this customer loyalty so that people are engaging with your brand, with your app, on a daily basis, month over month? Yeah, you know, a, a lot of it's about continuing to create that practical use and utility, um, and then having frequent use cases. Uh, we're offer ups a horizontal marketplace, and you know, for a long time, the the belief was that you couldn't get a horizontal marketplace to work. Everybody focused on vertical marketplaces. But the advantage that we have is that you can buy or sell anything. So, so what's the difference? So a vertical marketplace would be where you only sell babies, baby clothes, mm -hmm. right? So uh, to bring someone in, download a baby clothes app, that, that's relevant for a short period of time or, or maybe once, once every couple months when your child outgrows its, its clothes. But you know, if, if you can find anything on there, people have reason to use something over and over and over again. And this all leads into the growth because if people are using something that's practical frequently and they feel good about telling their friends about it, it increases the likelihood of this word of mouth growing, which is you know, what we notice is that the people come through a, a word of mouth are, you know, they, they're much more intense in terms of usage, um, brand advocates and everything as opposed to just the paid side. Yeah, so I mean, f one thing that differentiates my current company from companies I worked with in the past was that we're a subscription model. So for us, once a user purchases a subscription, we, we basically kind of take a back seat in a way because we know that this person has committed himself to a period of time within our application. So for instance, we know that if a user buys the annual product, at least 50% of them are going to renew. So I can basically bank on that looking for the future and saying, okay, I have this revenue stack or this revenue stream. It's going to be renewed at least at this rate for the future, so I don't actually have to worry about that anymore. So it, it becomes a slightly different uh, conversation at that point with, with how I communicate with my users because really I'm dealing with mostly just the top of funnel. So I bring in a lead and it's that moment before that user actually connects with the product because once they, they do and they make the purchase, the entire thing shifts basically away and you're saying, okay, you're, you're, you're good, go on, and we have teachers and whatnot, other support staff and sort of customer consumer success teams that, that deal with it, but at that point, you, you get to be a little bit more flexible and a little bit less, you know, hey, got to get that second purchase, got to get that third purchase. And, and that, That's really interesting, particularly if it's an annual model, you have basically a full year to show how much value you've, you've uh, provided as opposed to the you know, the sense of urgency of I need in the first seven days to be able to create these events so someone sticks around. It's actually pretty interesting. You bring up a good point. And, and one of the things, at least with a product like mine, we have an incredibly long conversion funnel. So it takes almost two years to, to fully actualize the, the conversion rates. And, and the reason is that if you download my product and, and in six months you didn't buy it, so the chances are you probably still don't speak English. So good for me. I could probably send you that email and make that, that connection, keep it top of mind. Um, so it's, it becomes a, yeah, you're right, it becomes a very different way of, uh, of speaking with the users and, and building up that sort of loyalty. Yeah, and games, of course, like, like there's, there's something in the gameplay, something in the character, something in the world that, that generates like that, that desire and interest to play the game. Yeah. Of course, there's like a lot of these habit-forming tricks, like why does it take eight hours to open a chest? Well, what do you do for eight hours straight a day? <laughs> do you do it like last thing before you go to bed and first thing in the morning, right? But but then like uh, like when you when you're playing on just the gameplay and content, you you as a developer you're easily stuck in the content treadmill where you just have to generate like more levels, more content, more playable stuff over and over again, which is of course very laborious and and uh, not necessarily like like tied to revenue uh, as such. Activity yes, retention but not necessarily revenue. So I, I think like, uh, like we, for example, like, uh, like our, our, one of our biggest changes in our games this, w this year was Angry Birds 2, which is soon a, a game that's been out for one year already. And only this spring we introduced like these, uh, these um, uh, like recurring tournaments and, and really like daily events and so forth. And these are extremely important for, for the audience to keep them active, keep them coming back uh, and, and even keep them spending money. 
And I would say even if, like for your product as well, it's, it's, it's a platform. So you yep. basically produce the platform and you allow the users to generate, it's user generated content yep. if you want. So probably the best example of that would be Minecraft, you know, a company that mm -hmm. gave a platform to developers and then you know, they were sold for billions of dollars without really needing to go out and to create more things. And I think whether you are looking from, so in, in my case, which is kind of the opposite approach is that I generate content outside of my application. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if you're learning a language, so you're able to see the growth and whatnot and, and, and actually use my, my platform outside of the actual platform. So you use me and then you go out into the real world and you see the advancements you're making and this drives you back into the application. And it's, it's kind of an interesting loop in that sense from trying to understand how exactly, do I do this in the middle of the night? You know, do I set it up now? How, and then how do I create a monetization loop that basically keeps you, you know, in that cycle. And then once you have all of these kind of ideas for how you think about your marketing strategy from the full funnel acquisition to retention and engagement, I'm assuming you all have marketing technology behind of it to really scale all of this across millions of different users. Could you speak to a little bit more about how you think about piecing together your marketing tech stack or even what that ideal situation would look like to really help your business grow? Well, I'd, I'd love to have like a consolidated product, but I, I guess like... <laughs> Why like, don't you have one today? Well, we come from like, a, I, I guess like a seven, eight year pedigree of bolting on things yeah. <laughs> to a system that seems to yeah. be working. <laughs> so, so I guess like, you know, it's a, you, you find like different solutions for different, different pain points and, uh, and you end up with a, with a patchwork thing. But, but of course, like this is, it, it, it takes a lot of strategic thinking. Uh, and, uh, and of course, like when you have a system and a portfolio running on a platform, it's not that easy to just shift around. But, uh, but that's what would it. it take to really just start brand new, the ideal situation? Impossible. Is impossible. it impossible? Yeah. It's impossible to stop them. I mean, I, I envy. I mean, it's a little bit strange to say that, but I envy startups today because they have so much options for what they need to do, and there's so much information that exists. I mean, when I remember working in, in my previous company, we, were, we had this legacy product, and it made money. And it, it always reminds me of this uh, Funny Simpsons uh, episode where you have uh, Mr. Burns, and he goes in, he, gets, he has a cough, whatever, he goes in to get tested, and they find out that he has all the diseases, everything. But they're all, like, basically in fighting for each other to, to, to take over his body. So they're in like perfect harmony. So he's, he's healthy and he's going to live forever. And I kind of felt like that was like my application, which was don't touch it. <laughs> it's making money. It's yeah. providing salaries. So just, just don't breathe. Don't look at it. You know, don't even, don't even think about it. And, but and at some point, it sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. It, yeah, but in the end, it's, it's, it's something that it's a, like a risk versus reward thing. So I, I've, been in, I've been in meetings with, with heads of product and CEOs and said, listen, we need to implement this thing. And they said, yeah, yeah but we, we are so scared to touch this code because we're making, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars a day that if we mess this up, that's it. It's all over. So, yes, we'd like to have a little bit more marketing automation, but we don't want to lose our business. And so the idea of resetting and, and basically starting over, it becomes a, a question of, is the thing that you're going to introduce into the application worth more than the risk of losing what you've already set up? Yeah. And in a lot of cases, it's the reason why I use the same crappy analytics provider that I've been using since you know the dawn of time because I'm like, everything's already set up, and I don't want to like get into the hassle of. I mean, having having yeah. worked in ad tech myself, there's there's many a many a, a scenario and anecdote in the industry of of somebody bolting on an ad SDK to make 25K ad revenue a day and, and crashing their app and losing out on 200K of IAP revenue. So that's, that's bad mathematics. I'm, I'm not an yeah. economist myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm yeah, and you talked about yeah. already changing your marketing tech stack a couple times. Yep, yep, yeah. I mean, it's, it's tough because, you know, things change, economics change, um, services that they offer change. So um, you can only uh, start to integrate them into your day-to-day -day decision making so much. We have, we have a bunch of different tech stacks that we kind of combine on our own, on our back end, and hopefully we've positioned ourselves to be able to replace some of them if necessary. But even if we do that well, you're still kind of reliant on them. And uh, it's, a, it's a business risk. So, you know, Adam's saying, you know, if something's working so well and your business is starting to work well, it's a risk if you're to rip something out or, or add something, yeah, an SDK that you don't fully trust, maybe you don't know them very well, it sounds good, but then then there are there's some third party dependency on your app that, that causes an issue and it brings your, 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 your app down and then all of a sudden the consumer's experience is ruined. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. You have an advantage if you're starting from square one today, but all you're doing is building, building dependencies over time. And I would even mention another point here, which is that in the mobile space, you're, you're really tied into your app. 
So it's not like I can create a second app in the ecosystem and basically say, okay, do whatever you want, like crash it, break it, you know, test it to, uh, to, the, to the cows come home, because Apple doesn't allow you to do that, and neither does Google. But in the web, obviously, you have the ability to say, okay, great, we have uh, one system that's working, so parse it, move it over, sorry, you know, partition it, move a section over, send some traffic, and let's test it and see how it works. And in the app environment, because everything has to happen in the same SDK, things become very complicated. A-B testing can only go so far. So creating these sort of multiverses, um, if you will, and within your app ecosystem becomes something that is, it's a necessity, but it's very delicate. So for old products to, to, to basically introduce those kinds of mechanisms, is, is, it's nearly impossible. So we found that doing a lot of testing actually in the web environment was, was more effective, and then we could say, oh, we got some learnings here, and then we transfer that over into the mobile ecosystem. But it was funny, well, like I, I really feel what you said about like sort of being envious about app developers right now who are coming into the market. Like it's, it's not many years ago that like even something like just attribution was just black magic. Yeah. So, yeah. so now it's, it's really sort of luxurious situation where you have like, a, like, like all the pieces of the tech stack available. So what are you excited for in the marketing tech world next? We mentioned a few already today on stage, instant apps, OS updates. Is there anything that's really exciting for you? Well, I, it's actually something that I'm not hearing a lot of people talking about, which is predictive analytics. So I'm really excited for somebody out there to start doing it. I mean, there are some companies that have been doing sort of A-B testing and up and lifts, you know, and whatnot, but really coming out with like solid algorithms that, that help you predict, and then obviously breaking that into a dashboard, saying, hey, listen, you know, focus the spotlight on, on this particular marketing channel and this particular kind of group of users. I mean, today that's really the, the job of your analyst, or actually in the case of my company, my, the guys that I hire today are basically PhD mathematicians when it comes to SEM, because they're the guys actually doing the wheels, turning around, you know, how things are supposed to look and move. So that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited for that to actually. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there, you, when you're operating a business, you're watching the trends, and sometimes something good happens, or something bad happens, and the question's why. And so, so often it's just like, did we expect that or did we not? There's no solution out there that can kind of help automate that. So you spend so much time kind of chasing your tail trying to figure out what's going on that uh, it's a lot of wasted time that I think if someone were, to, were able to create some type of solution there, it'd be, it'd be a lot of, it would be significant value add and it's not out there today. Yeah, I'm, I'm not like, I guess I'm not like that excited about any particular piece of technology right now, but like uh, this year has really been like booming on the, on the sort of influencer, mobile influencer and, and YouTuber like user acquisition, which has obviously been a big trend for a couple of years now, but mm -hmm. I think we're sort of getting to the point where you can find like really, really sweet like small pockets of users where, where like the more you can and harvest and refine your data and define who the valuable audiences are, you really, really can find like valuable audiences where, which, which apply only to your product and your game. Yeah, we actually did that in Social Point. We had a, so I, I set up a strategy there, which was, and I think it was one of the first, we were one of the first companies to do it, which was contacting not influencers across a mass spectrum where you're saying, hey, we want impressions for these guys to do videos, but really contacting, as you say, one guy who we know has our audience. And what we found was, I mean, it was in incredible. I mean, we, we launched with one of our applications with one of the YouTubers, and we were seeing just beyond ridiculous, you know, retention rates. People thought there were bugs in the system. They were spending hours and hours trying to like sift, exactly, sift through data. We saw this massive yeah. spike and it's like, no, 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 we posted a video and they're like, no, nah, impossible. <laughs> There's no way that you can achieve 45% third day retention. And I'm like, well, it happened. So, so I think, and that's the other thing is thinking about how, um, you know, thinking differently. I mean, uh, not to coin Apple or whatever and use their, their terminology, but really looking at your, I mean, all these tools, right, that we're, we're having, what does it really give us? It gives us time. It gives us time to think about what we're doing in, an, in a more critical way. And I think that's what I didn't have in the beginning. I was, you know, just running. And now that I've had this opportunity just to sit back and say, this is not working the way it should be working, and, and how, do I, how do I action on that and, and make changes? That's what I'm excited about. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you all for being here. So before we wrap up the conversation today, I think it is important for us to talk a little bit about brands. As a CMO, I know that you have brands still top of mind, even if you are thinking about all of these ROI strategies. So can you share a little bit more about what you're thinking in terms of how you balance building a long-term brand after your focus on this hyper-growth launch? Yeah, I mean, it, it, we talk about being a CMO or uh, yes. 
it's, it's all we'll about it's all about. about it's all about doing the right thing at the right time. So early on, if you call it hyper growth, it's figuring out how to get that going. But mm -hmm. then keeping people and and brand is what's going to keep people around for for years and years. It's what's going to allow you to differentiate against all the copycats out there. Um, and, and it starts with you know understanding your customer, how they're talking about you, how you want them to talk about you. Um, but for us, it's it's really just changing people's lives and being a part of people's lives. We haven't nailed it yet, but it's something that at our stage, it's it's a uh, it's something we're really focusing on. Mm, um, for us, it, it, and I think the three of us probably operate in a totally different ecosystem. I mean, you have a brand which is phenomenally and worldwide, it's it's known, and obviously you and I, we only have one product, so we're, we are trying to establish ourselves as a, as a brand. Um, and I think, for me, when I think about the idea of branding and I think about my, my product, I really try and look at it from the user perspective. And I try and emulate how a user might talk about my product in order to sort of retroactively fit that into my marketing strategy. So if people are speaking about me in a certain way or they're using me for a certain kind of vehicle, then I try and sort of attach myself to that in the branding mechanism and say, okay, if everyone is looking for work-related reasons for the reasons that they're using my app, so how do I brand myself into, into that vertical? Um, so it's a lot of talk, I, we, you know, we, we talk to our, our customers. I know a lot of people tend to think about their, you know, a billion downloads, how do you conceptualize that? And most people can't do that. So we try and humanize ourselves a little bit more, have some conversations, we have teachers, we, we bring them in, we, we, we interface with them face to face, and we get their feedback, and, and from there we're able to better assess sort of the future of our, of our company and where the, that brand might take us. Yeah, I, I, like not everything makes a great brand, but it's like, like premium gaming, it's a huge commodity market where people are downloading free products and you're trying to get them get them spend money on your product specifically. I, with, with, with Angry Birds, like, you know, it's, it was, again, like it's one of these stories where there's the right product at the right platform at the right place. And it's, it's, it's I, w I would say that it's less of a story about like a game, uh, like just, just breaking big in the market, but it's a, it's a, it's a product that sat as a, the game you download on your smartphone when you, when you first get one. And if you look at like Angry Birds growth as a brand, it's exactly like goes hand in hand with the growth of, of Android and, and, uh, and iOS and so forth. So it's, it's the devices like, like growing and people downloading what's hot. So, so that's, like, that's like, a, like, there's always like this bigger picture of where does your brand sit on the market and is it, is it like growing on its own right and, and so forth. But if, if like five years ago, we would have said that like, hey, we're gonna make a movie of this game. Like people would have been like, well, how, how, how the fuck do you make a movie out of something like that? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Like it's just, just stupid birds and, and there's not even anything, there's no plot. But now it's a motion picture distributed by Sony globally and, and uh, that's, that's, you know, you, you take your time sort of cultivating the brand and characters and so on and anything could happen. So I, I, I want to just end with one, one thing just from my personal perspective. I remember when Peter was saying that one of the things here is you want to learn something that could potentially change your business. And there's something I've been thinking about a lot since Apple came out with its new thing about you know, the, the subscription model. And I think it's something that you should see this as an opportunity in your business to create retention that you didn't necessarily have before, creating a, a time window for yourself. So if anybody's out there thinking about how they monetize their app, how they think about it, think about the, the subscription as, as a new tool for you in order to basically prolong your, your application life cycle as well as your, your user life cycle. I just throw that out there. All right, well, thank you for joining us. Congrats on your success so far and for coming out to Postback. I think that's a wrap for our session. Thank you. Thanks. Oh.